Social expectation drowns us all inside. What you have should be what I want, 'cause what I have just ain't alright. The clothes I wear, the way I comb my hair, how I live, oh I don't care. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, walaqibatu lil muttaqin, wassalatu wassalamu ala Rasulihi al Kareem. وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد Ecstasy is not demanded in worship Be restless in love Someone wrote to Maulana Tanwi Rahmatullahi I am much eager to be restless in the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Howsoever it be The Maulana Rahmatullahi wrote to him in answer but also make this prayer but also make this dua and prayer let there be comfort in my restlessness let there be comfort in my restlessness the answer is puzzling if we look at it the answer is amazing If anyone did not read this answer and was familiar with the Maulana's sermons, Rahmatullahi, and temperament, then they would have presumed that the answer would be, so you have a longing to be restless, but this is an involuntary condition. Why do you long for it? It is the same whether you get it or not. His teachings are based on the principle that a person should not concentrate on those affairs that are with that a person should concentrate on those affairs that are within his ability and should not worry about those that are outside his ability and are involuntary. This is a golden principle. because the involuntary conditions are experience on and off on and off involuntary on and off and a man gets pleasure from worship sometimes but not at another time so it is meaningless to worry about that the real thing is the deed the amal This is the essence of the Maulana's teachings. And he generally did not encourage those who pursued such halls or ahwal or conditions. Different prescription for every patient. Hence, one who had not read the Maulana's answer, Rahmatullahi, might have concluded that he would have advised against seeking to be restless. But he did not give this man such a reply. Actually, a healer prescribes according to the condition of the patient. There is no universal formula. So it is with a mentor who observes his disciple, his murid, and suggests a course of action suitable to him. This is the skill. that Allah grants to a perfect mentor. He deals with his disciples in a way that is best suited for them. The incoming is Allah's guest. And this is so deep, mashallah. May Allah, may Allah make us understand this. The incoming is Allah's guest. The Maulana Rahmatullahi did not give the answer as one would have expected of him because he might have felt that the longing in that man's heart because there is this incoming feeling that he wants to be restless in the love of Allah. So he did not give the answer as one would have expected of him because he might have felt that the longing, the incoming in that man's heart was an incoming thought And the Sufis believe that whatever comes to the heart from Allah 
should not be underestimated because they are guests sent by Allah. Understand this principle. The Sufis believe that whatever comes to the heart from Allah should not be underestimated because they are guests sent by Allah. They are exalted. If you receive the guests well, then it will come again and again and again. But if you do not do so, then it will go away displeased and never to come again. So, we have certain incoming thoughts from Allah, inspired by Allah. Certain good thoughts, good conditions, good... So the hate is likewise for this man. He has this incoming thought, which is a guest from Allah, a good hal and condition, that he wants to fall in love with Allah and he wants to be restless in that love. So Mawlana did not turn him away from it that he might not, that he might underestimate this feeling and treat this guest bad. So when these incomings, when these incomings come into our inside, they come into our breasts, into our chest, into our heart, when they come into it, we should treat them well. Receive them well for they are guests and they will come again and again and again. But if we treat them bad or sometimes if we disclose certain secrets that are supposed to be kept as secrets between us and between Allah and we go about talking and bragging, then they will never ever come back again. The Sharia demands comfort. Thus if the Maulana Rahmatullah had written to the man, that it was not correct of him to be restless, then that answer of his would have resisted the incomer to his heart. It would have resisted the incomer to his heart and hurt the man because the incoming would have stopped. But if he had encouraged him, and if he had encouraged him, then it would have contradicted the Sharia. For Sharia does not demand restlessness, but Sharia calls for peace, tranquility, and comfort, as the Quran says. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem Ala bi dhikrillahi tatma'innul qulub Lo, it is only with the dhikr of Allah that the hearts get peace and tranquility. Nothing else brings this comfort and tranquility. Only the dhikr of Allah. Allah bi dhikrillahi tatma'innul qulub. Surah Al-Rad. Behold, in the remembrance of Allah, in the dhikr of Allah, the hearts find satisfaction. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also prayed, Allahumma inni as'aluka rahmatam min indik tajma'u biha amri wa talummu biha sha'fi O Allah, I ask you for your mercy wherewith I may get peace of mind and my confusion be changed to composure. O Allah, I ask you for your mercy, for your rahmat, wherewith I may get peace of mind and my confusion, my disarrayed state may be changed to composure. This is evidence from the Quran and the dua of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is a dalil, it is hujjat and proof that the Sharia calls for peace and comfort, not restlessness. So look at Maulana's answer. It's an amazing answer. Under the circumstances, the Maulana gave the man an amazing answer. He said, but pray also that there should be peace in the restlessness. That's his answer. But pray also that there should be peace in the restlessness. For while... Restlessness is not desired by itself. It's not matloom. Peace is sought. Peace is matloom. But this peace or comfort, this peace or comfort is achieved through restlessness in Allah's love. Subhanallah. 
For while restlessness, bechaini, is not desired by itself, peace is sought. But this peace or comfort or sukun is achieved through restlessness in Allah's love. There is an uneasiness, an uneasiness, and a disquiet in love of Allah. And in this uneasiness and disquiet in the love of Allah, he seeks rest or peace. Though the uneasiness is not the goal, sometimes it results in peace. Sometimes it results in peace. One who has not passed by this path cannot really comprehend this fully. But it is certain that in the beginning, there is exuberance and tumult in love which gradually settles down, settles down to peace and comfort. Hence, he gave this reply. Spiritual succession is not easy. Clearly, it is not in everyone's ability to reform other people. No one can just memorize a few technical terms and begin the job of a heart and to do Islam of someone. No, it is, very, it is a very delicate work and very difficult to decide what the right course is for anyone. This is why spiritual succession or representation, khilafat, was not available easily in the order of Maulana Tanwi, rahmatullahi Unlike some sheikhs who are quick to offer representation to any disciple at choice when they find him a little energetic. Good health is not enough for a healer. Person might have good health, but that's not enough for him to be a healer. To reform oneself, to do, the, to do islah of oneself, is not the same thing as reforming other people. Every healthy person is not a physician. One has to go through a long process before one qualifies as a physician and can set up his clinic. Without that, no one will give a healthy person a certificate of a physician. Khilafat, succession, is a testimony. The same applies to disciples, murids. If anyone goes to a sheikh and he reforms him, and perfects him in different forms of worship and ibadah, then this does not mean that he is qualified to succeed or represent the sheikh. A representative of a sheikh is known as a khalifa, and the office he holds is the office of khilafat, and it presupposes an ability to heal other people and to heal them. This is not within everyone's ability. This is why Khilafa is handed over careful scrutiny and full satisfaction of the ability of the aspirant or incumbent. When the Khilafa is given to anyone, it is a certificate or a testimony before Allah's creatures that we have examined him and found him to be capable of giving spiritual treatment and cure of invisible weaknesses. Khilafat is not a certificate of soundness or a certificate of piety or a certificate of adherence to the sunnah. Thus, it is not allowed to hand over this office to anyone without satisfying oneself of the incumbent's ability to judge others and prescribe treatment to them according to their temperament and needs. Our mentors do not take the risk. Religious elders have different approaches. Some mentors hold that if they appoint someone to the khilafah, then Allah will make him capable, inshallah. 
But our mentors do not risk anything before satisfying themselves of the aspirant's ability to judge the temperament of the disciple and see what cure is suitable. Hence, this office is not within everyone's reach. And sometimes a person takes by with a sheikh. He puts his hands in the hand of a sheikh for his islah, for his reformation, for his treatment, to be cured of his weaknesses, his sicknesses, diseases of the heart. And what goes on? Thought of Khilafah is the worst hurdle in this path Thought of Khilafah is the worst hurdle. The respected Maulana Rahmatullah also said that if anyone goes to a sheikh for Islah, for reformation, then he must not hope for a degree of perfection, but he should concentrate only on the treatment, only on the treatment. Rather, he must obey the sheikh's command and conduct himself in his supervision without worrying about the results. Some people, when they approach a sheikh for islah and reforming themselves, they entertain a secret hope that he would someday, someday he would appoint them as his khalifa. He would give them khilafat. And that's a secret thought they have inside. This thought is the worst kind of obstacle to one's own reformation. As long as a person holds this thought, he cannot achieve perfect reformation in Islam. Rather, there is no possibility whatsoever of being reformed, no possibility. His intention is to receive an office. His connection with the Sheikh is not for Allah's sake, and he is not true in asking for a prescription so there is no profit in his bayat and going to the sheikh. Therefore, whenever you go to a sheikh, throw out such an ambition from your mind. Let your objective be reformation, Islam, only without hoping for a certain degree or status. Enthusiasm in worship it's not desired. You know, sometimes a person is doing dhikr. Or sometimes a person is reading Quran. Or a person is standing in salat. And he's feeling really, really good. He's feeling so good that thousands of pleasures of this world cannot be matched with this feeling he is having. A feeling of ecstasy in his worship. It is something which is good if it comes as a blessing. But it is not something which is desired and to go after and make that your object and goal. In another of his sermons, Maulana Tanwi, Rahmatullah alayhi, wa nawwar Allahu marqadahu, wa nafa'ana bi ulumihim amin. He says, longing in the sense of an enthusiasm is neither a demand by itself, nor is this, is this enthusiasm a condition of approval, that if I have this feeling, then my deeds are accepted. That's not a condition for approval, and it is not a demand. Deeds with a class, deeds with sincerity suffice, even without enthusiasm, and even if there is some heaviness and annoyance. The hadith is the dalil for that, which we will speak about later on. Isbagul wudu. We will mention that that hadith is the dalil of a person's making wudu under difficult conditions. So it means he's going through difficulty. There's no enthusiasm and joy, but he's doing it for Allah's sake. So this shows us. This is assumed evidence whereby, apart from the mentioned prayer, it is also proved that from such an annoyance and difficulty, the reward multiplies, and the rational evidence is that obedience is like food for some and medicine for some. Obedience is like food for some and medicine for some. And clearly a medicine is beneficial even if he is not inclined towards it. Besides, in such cases, 
use of it gives more strength and energy. There is much wisdom too in it, like protection, protection from ego and observation of one's own weakness and the like of that. It protects one from one's ego. It causes one to observe his own, his own weakness. This should be the view of a perfect person. So, while enthusiasm is praiseworthy, sincerity, a class, that is what is demanded. The Maulana outlines here an amazing principle. Many people are misled and confused. But he clarifies that zeal and enthusiasm are neither demanded in worship nor a condition for acceptance of deeds. There is no need to try to develop an enthusiasm in worship or to imagine that deeds will be accepted only if there is an enthusiasm in performing them. However, if the interest develops to do worship, then that is a blessing of Allah. It is a blessing of Allah. It is good and praiseworthy, but not demanded, nor is it a condition for approval. But sincerity, ikhlas, that is a must. If a deed is done without ikhlas, without sincerity, and according to the sunnah, then these two things are enough to achieve the objective. If a deed is done with sincerity, with a class, and is done in accordance to the sunnah, that's the two things, a class and accordance to the sunnah, then these two things are enough to achieve the objective. Insha'Allah, that deed will be approved by Allah, no matter with how much difficulty it is done, and even if it was, it was done with a disinclination, or a certain amount of lethargy and laziness, even then. Thus, if you offer the salah, telling yourself that it is fard, but you're, you're feeling kind of lazy, feeling kind of disinclined, but you tell yourself, listen, you offer the salah telling yourself that it is fard, it is compulsory, it's not about you or your feeling, it's compulsory. And you compel yourself to offer it Though you lack the enthusiasm, but you are sincere and you observe the sunnah, then inshallah it will be accepted with these two things. Allah will not punish you because of a lack of interest or a lack of willingness. These things are not necessary, nor are these things a condition. But again, if it comes then thank Allah for it and appreciate it for it is a gift of Allah. And what's the dalil for that? What's the proof of that? Salah is the coolness of my eyes. However, enthusiasm, ecstasy, joy, zeal are praiseworthy in the Salah. Don't think they are not praiseworthy. They are praiseworthy in the Salah. Evidence for this lies in the Prophet's saying, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what did he say? Ju'ilat kurratu aini fi salah Ju'ilat kurratu aini fi salah the, cooling, the coolness of my eyes have been made within the salat. In other words, the coolness of my eyes lies in salah. When I want to feel comfortable, happy, joyful, ecstatic, it is in salat. The coolness of my eyes have been made in the salat. Ju'ilat kurra tu aini fi salat. So the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, some people, they get real pleasure out of maybe eating delicious types of food. A person might get real joy and pleasure from this or from that or from something. But the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he found a pleasure he found a joy, a sweetness, ecstasy, and condition in the salah that he did not experience in any other thing in the world. That he did not experience in any other thing in the world. However, he did not tell anyone else 
that unless they experience the same thing in Salat, that their Salat will not be accepted? No, he didn't say that. Rather, he said, Sallu kamara aitumuni usalli. Read Salat like you see me performing Salat. Sallu kamara aitumuni usalli. Only that much is enough for the others. He didn't tell them, well, you have to have that condition too. So, but if it comes, thank Allah, but it is not a demand, and it's not a condition for approval. Sometimes in the night, a person misses his salat in Jamaat in the masjid, goes somewhere, so he comes back late. Now it's about 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, and he is feeling kind of sleepy and tired, and his body is unwilling. But if he does his salat with sincerity, in accordance with sunnah, Allah will accept that, inshallah. Deed without keenness. Sometimes you do a deed without keenness. You have to do a lot of effort in it. It gets more reward. Some people are very worried that they do not get enough flavor and savor and enjoyment in the salat. And they do not develop enough enjoyment and enthusiasm in Salat. So they're worried, they're very worried. Know that this condition is never demanded. Only Allah's pleasure is desired. If you get that, then be satisfied. In fact, the Maulana Rahmatullah says that sometimes one who does something of worship with compulsion and heaviness gets a greater reward though he gets no pleasure in the deed than one who gets much pleasure in his worship. Evidence for this is in the hadith which quotes the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as saying Isbaagul wudu doing wudu and doing it in a complete way in totality alal makari upon or under adverse conditions the Rasul salam said about such things, he said, Fadalikumur ribat, Fadalikumur ribat. Meaning that if anyone makes wudu at a time when he experiences much difficulty and heaviness, then he gets the reward as though he's in jihad. He gets the reward of jihad. This is like jihad. This is like being on the frontier. Like in winter. When the water is very cold and the time of Salat is running out, when he performs wudu at such time, because it is Allah's command, then this deed is like keeping vigil in the night during the jihad at frontiers. This deed is like keeping vigil in the night during jihad at the frontiers. Surely he gets no enjoyment in such a wudu, but a deed, a deed done with pleasure, causes no difficulty. Thus, a deed involving difficulty, it's not a general principle, you know. A deed involving difficulty sometimes, sometimes earns more reward than one in which one finds pleasure. Congratulations to the one who finds no enjoyment in Salat. So it's not a general principle, but sometimes... That puts my game more reward. This is why Maulana Gangohi, Rahmatullah said, I congratulate the person who never ever got pleasure from his salat all his life. But he continued to offer this salat. But he continued to offer salat in obedience to Allah's command. Isn't he what? Congratulations. If one gets pleasure in offering salat, then that is a good thing. But there's the risk of one's offering it, offering it now because of the enjoyment one gets. Not for Allah's pleasure, there's a risk of that. Sincerity may be wanting. Besides, if one gets pleasure in salat, he begins to feel elated and proud. And he says, I have gained a high status. And he feels egotist and saintly. Against this, the other person faces no such risk. The Salat of the retired man, the Honorable Maulana Tanwi Ali Rahma, used to say 
that the people bracket ecstasy with ruhaniyat, spiritualism. If they found pleasure in worship, then they thought that they had more ruhaniyat and spiritualism. This is wrong, it is galati, wrong. Rather, the more the sunnah is observed in any worship, the more spiritualism there is in it, the more sunnah there is in it. These conditions of ecstasy have nothing to do with ruhaniyat and spiritualism. He then gave an example. There are two men, one of whom is retired. He lives on, luxuriously he lives on. He has children who earn enough and they are all married. So he has no worry. He is comfortable with nothing to do. He prepares himself and performs wudu well before azan, on hearing which he goes to the masjid and gets a place in the first row where he offers tahiyatul masjid and the sunnah salat and now he waits for the congregational salat engaging meanwhile in dhikr and dua. When the prayer begins, he joins it very humbly and afterwards returns home calmly waiting for the next salat. There's another person now, the hawker's salat, the hawker. The other man sells his wares on his cart and earns for himself his wife and his children. He stands at a street corner and announces his wares. He supports 10 people in his home. So he is constantly worried about feeding them. When in the midst of dealing with customers, he hears the adhan. His mind goes to the adhan and the subsequent salat. So he tries to hurry up now with the customers. At the right moment of the congregation, he parks his cart to a side, covers it with a sheet of cloth, and hastens to the masjid, makes a hurried, hurried wudu, and joins the jamaat. Naturally, his mind and heart are diverted elsewhere, and he worries lest someone should steal his cart. Though he tries to concentrate, he tries to concentrate on the salat, Yet his thoughts roam about, roam about. Nevertheless, nevertheless, he offers the salat according to the sunnah. And then the remaining salat, which are sunnah or optional, he performs it. And then he hurries back to his cart where he resumes his business. Tell me, who has more spiritualism? The Maulana, Rahmatullah alayhi, asked, whose salat? has more ruhaniyat, spiritualism, the retired man's or the hawker's? On the face of it, zahiran, the retired man seems to have more of it on the face of it. But the fact is that the hawker's salat has more spiritualism. The reason is that the first man has ample time. He has ample time with him and his feet is not extraordinary because of that. What big extraordinary feat? The second man is hard pressed for time. So, he's, so his feat is exceptional and extraordinary. He finds it trying to put aside his merchandise, go to the masjid in answer to the adhan, and he undergoes a greater mental, physical hardship. So his salat has more spiritualism in it he will get a greater reward for his effort. Therefore, it is wrong to presume that worship will be accepted only when there is a longing and enthusiasm. This principle, this thought is wrong, galat. So said Maulana Shafali Tanwi, alayhi rahma. So, the summary of what has been said this evening, obedience is counted. What is counted by Allah is the will to obey. Whether you like it, whether you don't like it, but the will to obey, that is what is counted. He had commanded his servant to worship and he submitted himself in obedience to him. Even if circumstances diverted his attention. But since he came with sincerity and abided by the sunnah, 
Allah accepts his worship. This is why the Mawlana Rahmatullahi asserts that one must not worry about enthusiasm in worship. It is the cup bearer's favor. It is the cup bearer's favor. Of course, if anyone receives naturally, of course, there is no doubt. If anyone receives the blessing of enthusiasm and zeal too, then he must show gratitude to Allah for it. O oh Allah, you made it easy for me to worship and I do get pleasure in it. So thank Allah for it and show gratitude. But it is not necessary to go too much after this pleasure. Therefore, the Mawlana Rahmatullah concluded with a verse of Mawlana Rumi Rahmatullah which means you have no right to demand from the cup bearer to give you clear, pure wine, not diluted. You have no right to demand from the cup bearer to give you clear, pure wine, not diluted. Rather, whatever he gives you, it is his favor, whether pure or diluted. What matters is that he gives it once more. Maulana Rumi in the Masnawi says, you have no right to demand from the cup bearer to give you clear, pure wine, not diluted. Rather, whatever he gives, whatever the cup bearer gives, it is his favor, whether pure or diluted. What matters is that he gives it. In the same way, pray to Allah for the ability to perform amal and deeds. When he gives you the ability, it is his favor. Whether there is in your deed pleasure for you or not, enthusiasm or lack of it, be pleased that you are at least enabled to perform deeds. Do not worry to go beyond that. <clears throat> Summary. In short, to have excitement, enthusiasm, and pleasure in salat, in worship, is not demanded. Also, these are not a condition for any worship to be accepted. Hence, you must concentrate on engaging in worship with sincerity, ikhlas, and by abiding by the sunnah without worrying about those things. However, if you do get them, then that is very good. Otherwise, there's nothing to grieve over. Very many, many people today worry worry that they offer salat but find no pleasure in it. The result is, you see, you see, Maulana is so, has so much of wisdom and this is so true. Many people today worry that they offer salat but find no pleasure in their salat. The result is that they begin to think little of their deeds and their worship. They begin to think little of their deeds and their worship. They must not do that. And sometimes then they even start leaving it off now. They must not do that. They must not do that. It is enough to have two things in worship. Ikhlas, sincerity, and observance of the sunnah. May Allah enable us, all of us, to act accordingly. Amin. We have about four or five days again. And this should bring us to the close of Maulana's discourses here. This is the fourth volume of spiritual discourses and we hope to close it off this Ramadan inshallah. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi Subhanakallamu wa bihamdik Nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta Nastaghfiruk wa natubu ilayk Social expectation Drowns us all inside What you have should be what I want Cause what I have just ain't alright the clothes I wear, the way I comb my hair, how I live, oh, I don't